Happy first day of fall. Did y'all realize today's the first day of fall? It's felt, well, it still feels like summer right now, but it felt like fall a week ago. Just a couple of quick reminders for you. Um, if you have your alabaster offering, there is a, a thing out in a church or something out in the lobby for you that you could put that money in. Um, next week, I believe uh, Pastor Layton will be with us. Um, if you are interested in Women's Hope, Hope Builders, there's a sign-up sheet. It is Friday evening at what time, Barbara? Barbara Keys, light. What time is Hope Builders? I know you were talking. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> 6.15 for snacks. 7 o'clock for the service. So ladies, if you're interested in that, if you would give her um, your name out in the foyer so that she can prepare accordingly for it. Let's worship him this morning. Aren't you thankful that we have the assurance to know that we are his and he is ours? Let's worship him this morning. This is a little different than how we usually do it. So we're going to need your help here with some hand claps.
Jesus is the answer. There's no answer found in the election that's coming up. There's no answer in anything that man will try to do. But only Jesus is the answer for the troubles, trials of this old world and these individual lives. Jesus has the answer for you today. Amen? Oh, that was weak. Amen? That's all right. Come on. We can, we can be a little rowdy. We can be a little noisy. Those, those people at the ball games yesterday, you could, you could hear them screaming and yelling and carrying on. And we sat here like we're just happy to be Christian. <laughs> he brought us joy. He brings us peace. He is with us each and every day. So it's okay to get just a little bit excited and say amen. It's all right. Nobody's going to worry about what you said. We go, oh, well, somebody might think I'm a little radical. Well, praise the Lord if they do. Amen. Let's join in worshiping. His presence is always so real to us. And he's always in this place for us. Worship him this morning. You're awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, God the Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you are nice, sweet race. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you 
are lights we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance to see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say, You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise. To you and I, we praise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. He is in this place this morning. Amen. Give him praise. It is good to be in his presence. And whenever we gather together, he says that he will be with us. I was so excited when I was sitting there listening to the choir. Most of you may know, or you may not know, but Roy Hoffman does the sound for us at the 9 o'clock service at uh, First Church faithfully every week. He said, uh, I had to get a crane this morning. I thought he was talking about Kathy. Uh, but uh, he said, I had to get a crane this morning because Kathy was determined to take our alabaster offering to church this morning. Said so it was it was heavy. It was I said, Kathy's coming to church, and he said, Yeah, she's she's bringing her alabaster gift and she's coming to church. Well, I was waiting to see her sitting back in her normal place, and here she is in the choir. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God has been with you. God has helped you, and God is good. Absolutely. It's been a long, long road, but uh, she knew that when she came back, she had to be used of the Lord in singing in the choir. Praise the Lord for that. We are blessed that God hears and answers all of our prayers, all of our concerns. I want to share with you uh, just a request this morning. Tom Tolliver, Mr. Tolliver, who goes to First Church, I think he's 91 years old, maybe 92. But he came in and he said, Pastor, I'm so heartbroken this morning. And I said, Brother, what's wrong? And he said, My wife and I few years ago took a guy that was a drunk on the street corner. Said he'd come over to our house and he'd sit outside on the deck and my wife would fix him a grilled cheese or some soup or he said most of the time he was drunk but we kept loving him. And he said and as time went along his life began to change and transform because of the love of Jesus. Said he, he, he got a job. He's been working at the Kroger for some time. Has a girlfriend that they were planning on getting married here in just a few months. And said God had done just such a wonderful thing this young man's life. And he said, I got a call this morning that he was dead. Just died walking down the street. He said, my heart's broken. You see, they lost their son not too long ago. And most of us understand that that's not the way it's supposed to happen. But he said, Pastor, I, I even just sort of questioned, God, why? 
He was having an influence on other people's lives. God, why? He said, but I had to rest in the promise that God's ways are always the right ways. So would you pray for Tom Tolliver and Phillips? He invests in so many people on the west side. He's got him a little motorized scooter now. He rides from First Church down to Grace Church. But he won't leave till Phillips gets in the car. She said, I wish he'd go ahead of me. He said, I'm afraid he's going to try to run me over. <laughs> but he's still serving the Lord. Still has a passion to see people come to know Jesus. Even if it's inconvenient. Even if it's out of their way. So pray for them. Pray for Glaita as she's in rehab. She has a fractured pelvis. Pray that the Lord would help her and protect her. Would you just bow your heads? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Maybe you just want to come and you just want to invite him into the service this morning. He's already here. Or do we sit in your presence? And it is awesome to be in your presence. You invite us to call you daddy because you love us so much. You care about everything that we care about. And Father, sometimes, like with this young man, we don't understand. We can't make the pieces fit. But Lord, even in spite of circumstances, we have to realize and hold on to the fact that you are a sovereign God. That your ways are higher than my ways. That even though there are distractions, even though there are interruptions, Father, we have to accept them and realize that your timing is perfect, not mine. This morning, Lord, we just invite you into our presence. You've already ministered to us. And we know that you are the answer. And until we as a, the United States of America surrender to your power, the answers will never come. Help us, Lord, to realize that we need to depend on you more than we do our political party, more than we do the government, more than we, we do even the place that we work. We surrender ourselves to you. Be with Glada. Thank you, Lord, for touching Kathy and her being with us. Thank you, Lord, for her willingness to lift her voice to you in praise today. Continue to touch, continue to strengthen. Move on our hearts today. Remove the distractions. Father, we just anticipate your love flowing through us and we pray these things in the wonderful and the powerful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Amen Amen Aren't you thankful to know that if we come to him whether it's here or any place else that he has the power to change us Amen. That when we come into his house and into his presence, we don't have to bring our shame with us. We can drop it at the door because 
in the Father's house, he is willing to forgive and justify us. I think you need to stand to your feet. Yeah, let's stand as we worship him this morning. We've got to worship him this morning. Make sure you listen to the words. Make sure you say the words. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your stray. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. these words. Prodigals come home and the helpless find home. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Prison doors fly wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles take place and the cynical mind fades. The love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Oh, Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. It ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. Check your shame at the door. Cause it ain't welcome anymore. Kelly, go back to prodigals come running. I, I don't think you were running. I don't think you were excited to think that you were once a prodigal. You were once a prodigal, and you had to come running to the Lord, where the helpless find hope, and love is on the move here in the Father's house. He is today. Let's sing that part again. Wide, and the 
on the move you're in the father's house check your shame at the door it's not welcome anymore he's made provision amen he has made provision amen amen well praise the lord you look pretty good you're welcome rusty thank you rusty it is good to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to be able to worship him in spirit and truth. It is good to realize that we have a church family that loves us and supports us in our times of need, but likewise in our times of joy. Hallelujah. In our times of joy as well. Well, let me just remind you of a, a couple of things. Ladies, if you haven't signed up for the um, uh, Women of Hope uh, service this uh, Friday night, make sure you do that out in the foyer. There's other things out there to sign up for, and you take advantage of those. And then also next Sunday, next Sunday, um, our district superintendent, you all know him, uh, Brett Layton will be here for his annual visit and will be speaking uh, for us next Sunday. So, so be on your best behavior, okay? Be on your best behavior. I told him you would be okay, but uh, pray for him. Uh, Beth will not be able to be here with us. She is taking her father uh, to see Amy. Uh, that next weekend, her mother's coming up and some of the other siblings continue to pray for Amy as she uh, has the pancreatic cancer. Uh, pray that the Lord's will would be done, that the Lord would just help all of them. Uh, sometimes we, we forget. It's on our list, but sometimes we need to be reminded. Open your hearts to Angie as she comes to share with us. Or Kim. Sorry, you're not Angie, you're Kim. I 
have been washed by the blood. Yep. I'm no stranger to no prison. I've worn shackles and chains. But I've been freed and forgiven. I'm not going back. I'll never be the same. And all my hope is in Jesus. Well, thank God that yesterday's gone. And all my sins are forgiven. And I am washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man. Breaks him down to his knees. God, I've been broken more than a time or two. Then he picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. And all my hope is in Jesus. Well, thank God my yesterday's gone. And all my sins are forgiven. And I, I've been washed by the blood. Well, thank God my yesterday's gone, and all my sins are forgiven. Well, I, I've been washed by the blood. Amen. Aren't you thankful for that? Jim. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All my sins are forgiven. They've been washed by the blood. And I don't have to remember them anymore. Amen. Neither does God. Yes. Neither does God. Amen. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. What a wonderful time to be together. Thank you, Kim, for, for that song and that reminder that all of our hope is found in one place. That's Jesus Christ. Thank you, choir, for reminding us that Jesus is the answer for what we are facing today, and that uh, he will be faithful and he will be true to us. Well, as we've been looking at uh, talking about the fact of, of are, are we any different as followers of Christ than the world? Do Christians look any different than those that we work with who do not profess anything. I think it's where we're coming to the place of wanting to be more like Jesus, wanting to come to the place to be filled with him more and more to understand that we need to look more like him than we do the world. And that's only through our behavior through what we do, through our character and through our integrity, speaks volumes to the world. 
I want us to look at uh, Paul's writings as we've been looking. Found in 1 Timothy, where we've been focused the past few weeks. In Timothy, Paul is writing to this young preacher, and he's saying to him, there are some things that you need to learn. I'm in prison. I hope to come to you soon, but if not, stay strong in the faith. Don't go back to the things that you used to do. Don't go back to the things that used to appeal to you in your heart and in your life. But as Paul writes to him in the New King James Version, it it will say, it is translated, a few faithful sayings to hold in your heart as he writes to two young preachers, Timothy and to Titus. The very first thing that I want us to see is found in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. And it says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. I think what Paul was saying to Timothy, I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. This is something you need to take note of. This is something that's worthy for all to hear. So make sure this is a part of who you are, who you are as a pastor, and what your church believes. That Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am the chief. Of whom I was the worst. That he came to the world to save sinners. Now, when we begin to look at that and when we begin to understand what that scripture says, it's basically saying that Jesus came to save sinners. That's why he came as God may and while he was born was to be a savior to the world. In that scripture, we find the word world, which refers to all humanity. It's not referring to, well, there's a select group of people that I came to save. It's not referring to, well, there are a few that I want to be a part. Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, make sure they understand that God sent his son for all humanity. Everyone. No exceptions. And he goes on, and in that scripture it says, the word saved. Now, we who have been around the church, we who maybe have grown up and and understand the fact that when someone stands up and says, I'm so glad that he saved my soul, I am so glad that I've been saved, if we say that phrase to some people who who are outside of these walls, the first question they're going to say is, saved from what? You see, we have to be cautious in using the terminology that we know with those who don't know Jesus. So we can begin to understand the word saved as meaning a deliverer. I have been delivered from my transgressions, my sins, from the things that are wrong, from evil, or I have been rescued from all of those things that had control over me. You see... We need to understand the context with whom we're speaking. We think that everybody knows the Ten Commandments. We, we talked about that in the Gallup poll. And, and we think everybody knows the things that we know. And, and once we've been around the church a long time, we begin to think that everybody knows the same things. And why do we need to say them again? It's a trick of Satan. Because there's a whole world out there. Humanity is out there that is not heard fully and understands the word of God. So we need to focus on our priorities, focus on what we are called to. Some churches today talk about their target audiences. A couple of particular churches that I'm aware of, they said, well, you know, we're, we're going after those uh, 20-year-old to 40-year-olds. And if, if those above that don't like what we're doing, that's okay. We're not the church for them. Well, interesting concept. 
They begin to market for those. They begin to, to do uh, 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 smoke and lights, I call it. You know, it's, it's time for worship, so the, the house lights come down. Rusty's up there getting it on his guitar. <laughs> and we've come for a show. We've come to be entertained. Now, I have, a, I have a pretty peculiar, unique thought in that. Is that Jesus came to be what? Light in the world. So if we blacken and darken the sanctuary, are we inviting evil into our presence? Just my thoughts. It should be light. We should come to a place where, where we want the presence of the Lord. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong. They are, they are reaching people. But I want us to understand that we are not in the business of marketing target groups. We are not in the business of marketing a particular area to reach people. Jesus had a target group. We read it in that scripture. Jesus' target group must be the same that ours is. His was that he came for sinners. He came for the lost. No matter their age, no matter their race, no matter anything about them, rich or poor, Jesus came for all. So it's important that we understand as we go through this life, as we go through understanding the calling that is upon us, that he has called us to be the light in the darkness to those who don't know him. John 10.10 says it this way, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. He's talking about evil. He's talking about Satan. Only comes to steal and kill and destroy that which is good. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. Would you rather have death or would you rather have life? I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, Jesus is saying, I want to bring you life, but just not enough to get by. I want to fill you to overflowing with my presence, with my being. With my spirit, I want to give you life that just overflows and people just are drawn to you because of the presence of the Lord. Life or death. We do make that choice. We make that choice. Jesus said in Matthew, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to save that which had no hope, that which lived in evil and things that didn't please God, that which is sin or wrong things that break the heart of God. When we begin to talk about basic doctrine, which we did a couple of weeks ago, and the basic truths that we need to have our foundations built on as followers of Jesus Christ, and we need to be prepared to answer questions that someone might say, well, why would God come down to earth? We can give a good churchy answer. We can... We can try to say all of the, the right things. But Timothy is, I mean, Paul is saying to Timothy, here's your response. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all to accept that Christ came into the world to save the sinners. That's why God came to earth. He sent his son, leaving the riches of glory, the presence of the Almighty, to come to a lowly stable to be born of a virgin named Mary, to live for 33 years only to be crucified to a tree, 
for crimes that he didn't do. But he did it because of you. It's not someone else. We need to understand that this relationship is very personal. It's something that Jesus, God sent his son Jesus to do this for me. Just for me. If I had been the only one, I firmly believe he would have sent him. That I might have life. And have it more abundantly. So we understand that Jesus, one of the faithful sayings is that Jesus came to save sinners. Now we have to remember that Paul is writing to young preachers. He's writing specifically to Timothy and to Titus. Paul wrote many other letters to the churches, uh, uh, lifting them up, also telling them of their their issues and what they needed to address and and was being helpful and corrective to make sure the gospel was presented in the right way. But in this particular case, in Timothy and in Titus, he is writing to two young pastors. He himself is in prison. But he's saying, I want you to get the message. I want you to keep on keeping on. And he began to realize, however the communication worked, that these two young pastors, Paul is writing because they're dealing with stresses and they're dealing with pressures. Paul knew of the stress. Paul knew of the pressures. Paul knew it because he was in jail for what he believed. And he's writing to these two young preachers. He's writing to Timothy, and as as we read before last week, that Timothy is in Ephesus, and he's there because Paul said, I'm leaving you here to, to help the church along. I'm leaving you here to be the shepherd over the sheep of Ephesus and to lead them in the right direction, in the right purpose on how they are to live. But from Paul's understanding, it appears as though that Timothy is being hassled because of his young age. Now, I know that could never happen in our our world today. I've been around the church since I was two years old. I think I know better, preacher. Could it? You see, there were those of the Jewish faith who knew probably more than even Timothy. Timothy was raised by godly women, so he had knowledge. But there were those who were trying to say to him, I have more knowledge than you. How is it that you are are instructing me? And Paul knew that he was being harassed because of his youth. And he says in the scripture, don't let anyone look down on you. Because of your youth. He's basically saying God has anointed you to serve in this capacity. Timothy knew the stress. Titus knew the stress. Can I tell you, the stress of pastoral ministry had begun to cause Timothy to even have some physical problems. Paul addresses it. Paul says, I know you've been sick. I know you've had some illness. I know you've had uh, some sickness in your life. And he addresses that. But he's saying to Timothy, hold steady. Your calling is from God, not from man. Your calling came from God, not from man. Oh, although you are under the authority of Paul, who has sent you to this church to be a part of leading them and guiding them and helping raise them up to become more and more godly in their ways and in their thinking. Who knows? Maybe Timothy's issues were stress-related. I had a pastor once tell me when I was young, yes, I was young once. When I was young, he said... 
Has God called, really called you to be a minister? And before I could answer, he said, wait, don't answer. He said, I'm I'm here to tell you that if there's any way in your life to do anything else, choose now to do it. If there's any way that there's some doubt in your mind that God has called you, don't be a pastor. Why do you think he said that? He was an older pastor. He understood the pressures. You see, the truth of the matter is, pastors are not heart surgeons. Pastors pastors are not neurologists or cancer specialists. But I can tell you that pastors deal with all of those situations that their people go through. I can tell you that pastors hold close to their hearts and their prayers the burdens of many that no one else knows about. So, is it a profession that we just want to do because we can get up and speak in front of people, we can draw a crowd, we can... can, uh, uh, Keep them entertained? Well, except for those who sleep. But we can keep them entertained. I had someone tell me one time, said, oh, pastoring's not hard. I can get up there and give them a good show, a good speech, challenging. Challenging. That's not the point. You can be well-versed in Scripture. You can be well-versed in your presentation. But unless you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon your life and are called by God to serve as a pastor, Paul is saying to Timothy, do anything else. But if you are called as a pastor, give it 100% no matter what you are doing. Facing what you are challenged with. Despite the tension and the pressure, Paul wants both of these young men to remember that they were called to pastoral ministry. They were appointed to a place to serve with their whole heart and their whole being. And he writes from prison trying to, to encourage them. And he says to them, do not neglect the gift that is in you. Do not do your own thing, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. He is saying, if you start to doubt, if you start to drift, remember that when you were with us, We laid our hands on you. We prayed over you that God would use you in building the kingdom, that God would use you in spite of yourself. He said, remember the calling that you have. It's not just about pleasing a crowd. It's not just about a target audience. Remember the assignment that you have. And that assignment, he said to both of them, was to defend the faith. Now, I'm not talking about arguing. I'm not talking about debating. I'm talking about standing for the truth and preaching the truth. Protect the teachings that have been passed down to you. Remember, in the, in the Old and, the, and in the New Testament, rather, there wasn't the Bible, there wasn't the printed word. It was taken from Paul to Timothy, and Timothy would, would teach it to those who were uh, growing in their leadership. It had to be passed down, and it had to be a very personal relationship. 
He also says to both Titus and Timothy to take care of the spiritual development of those who are under your care. That's a daunting task. Task. Can I tell you that I believe all pastors will be held accountable for those who are under their care? will be held accountable whether they preached the truth, whether they lifted them up in their times of need. But he says, understand that you are leading God's people. And he also said, remember, you're representing Christ to a lost and a dying world. He is saying, he is saying to Timothy and Titus, understand that your character matters. Whether you're at the grocery store, whether you're at the school, whether you're at work, your character and your integrity matter because it represents Christ, the one who we are to represent. That we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. We can't do our own choosing. We can't decide to do things our way for a while. And then step back in and say, well, God, now now do something with me. Let's do this. The Lord is calling for the pastors, the ministers, to be 100% committed to the message of Christ. The third thing that I want us to see that he says is a worthy thing to remember is that a spiritual workout is a worthy workout. Now, you know, this is one of my favorite scriptures. (laughs) For bodily exercises profits a little. Amen. (laughs) But godliness is profitable for all things. Having promise of the life that is now is and that is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, worthy to be accepted. This is something you want to remember. Your spiritual formation, your growth is of great importance to the way that you live. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach. We're going to be, we're going to be accused. We're, we're going to face trials. Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So let's get into some exercise. I like spiritual exercise a little better. Scripture talks about running. You know, I only run if I get chased. It's the only reason. But the psalmist says to us, I will run the course of your commandments for you will enlarge my heart. The more faithful I am to you in pursuing you, in running the course of what you have taught and what we should believe, you will enlarge my heart and understanding. Hebrews, very familiar scripture. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside the things that weigh us down and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race set before us. It doesn't mean we give up in the middle of the race and say, I'm tired. It means we keep going even if it's just one foot in front of the other, knowing that we're called to live for him. Also talks about walking. I kind of feel the same way about walking. We walk by faith and not by sight. Helping us to understand that we walk in faith, that we won't always see and understand the things. And in Galatians, he says, I say then, walk in the spirit, And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He's saying that there is a way for you to resist temptation, to remain faithful to the Lord. For when I walk in the spirit, it will not direct me to things that will cause my pathway 
uh, in my pathway cause me to stumble. He will lead me in ways of righteousness. Walk in the Spirit in all things. As you therefore receive Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. If you've received him into your life, it's not a matter of coming and sitting on a pew and saying, okay, Lord, try to move me. It's a matter of saying to the Lord, I am here. I want to walk with you on this journey we call life. First John says, he who, he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. It means that we have a desire to become more and more like Jesus in our actions, in our attitudes, in the way that we raise our children, in the way that we do things in life, that we are constantly aware of him. Now that's supposed to say, (laughs) I'm not sure what it's supposed to say. There we go. Where are we? Imitators of God. This is a translation problem. (laughs) So, our sacrifice is a sweet aroma to the Lord when we walk in Him. The other exercise is that of jumping. Do we need to practice jumping this morning? I didn't see any hands volunteer. Um, I, I used to hate jumping jacks. Anybody do? I don't even know if they still do them. In they still do them, Liam? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, <clears throat> it says, "Blessed are you when men hate you." That's encouraging, isn't it? And when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast your name as evil for the son of man's sake. Rejoice in that day when you're being persecuted. Rejoice in that day when they speak evil of you. And then he says, leap for joy. Some of you haven't leaped for a hundred years. Matter of fact, I saw, uh, I think it was on YouTube or something, where they challenged some older middle-aged adults to skip through the office. Have you tried it lately? <laughs> Seems like something you should remember to do, wasn't it? They, you should look it up. <laughs> it's peculiar. Rejoice in the day and leap for joy. There comes a time in our lives, and, and I'm old enough to remember that in the camp meetings and even in church services, when we weren't so reserved in how we worship the Lord, that there would be one who would come down the aisle kicking his legs, praising the Lord with his hands raised high because he was filled to overflowing in the presence of the Lord, but we're much too dignified. He says, leap for the Lord in your joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in the manner their fathers did to the prophets. Talks about lifting. Liam plays football. Do you have to do weightlifting? No? Good for you, buddy. Uh, But we need to understand we have a responsibility of lifting the Lord high. Lifting him high. To you, O Lord, I'll lift my soul. Lift your hands in the sanctuaries and bless the Lord. We're afraid to move. How can the Spirit move on us when we're saying, Lord, don't, don't, don't fill me with your presence. I might accidentally raise a finger, raise a hand. You know, we will sing the old song, uh, let's just praise the Lord. Let's lift our hands toward heaven and then everybody gets freedom. Oh, everybody's doing it. Brandon, Mavis, I appreciate you being obedient in the spirit and when you want to praise the Lord, feel free to lift your hands at any time because it's not for attention. 
It's not for something just for show. It's in full reverence of the Lord, acknowledging him for who he, who he is. Timothy says there in chapter 2, verse 8, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere. You'll notice there are those who come to the altar every Sunday during our prayer time. I didn't tell them to do that. I don't ask them to do that. But they come and they want to bow in the presence of the Lord, seeking him and his goodness. And it says, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. Do you know the interesting thing about lifting up holy hands? You see, I, I don't think doing this is lifting up holy hands, right? You've got to open them or turn them up to receive. It indicates that I'm giving away everything of me and I want more of you. So a spiritual exercise is that of, of uh, lifting. And yes, the Bible says you can dance. Now you, you, think about, you think about the old days. You think about Old Elk River. You think maybe about the church that you grew up. There were those who strutted down the aisle just praising the Lord. I can remember some little old ladies. You might not call it dancing, but they were shuffling and moving their feet pretty good. And they were having a great time as they... Praise the Lord. David danced before the Lord. Now, now we're not talking about doing the hoochie-coochie and all that kind of stuff. We're talking, to, yeah, it says my age, doesn't it? Uh, <clears throat> we're talking about being in the presence of the Lord. And if you can't even hold your feet, you can't even keep your feet still. I've seen Barbara Light. When the Lord is upon her, she begins to just sort of march and dance around and her hands lifted high. It's nothing for Barbara. It's not about Barbara, but it's about that she feels and senses the Holy Spirit so strongly that she's got to move. Psalm 150 says, praise him with the timbrel and with dance. The fourth thing that I want us to see quickly is that partnership with God is powerful. Here he says it again. This is a faithful saying, so we need to take note of it. If we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny his own character. He cannot deny himself. If we die with Christ, we live with him. That's the resurrection partnership that we have with Jesus. And that's powerful for us to understand. If we endure with Christ, we will reign with him. And that's the regal partnership that's powerful that we belong in the presence of the Almighty. But if we are faithless, he still remains faithful. He can't deny who he is. He said he'd never leave us. He'd never forsake us. He'll do what his word says. And that is the powerful promises of God. And then finally, brings us full circle. If we are believers, we have a responsibility to behave like it. To live like it. When someone's watching or when they're not watching. To live consistently for him. The truth is, we may think we do things in secret. We may think that we can hide things from the church or our family or our work. But we need to remember that God knows exactly where we are, what's in our heart, what our attitude is. In Titus, he gives this final faithful saying, 
These things I want to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. It's not saying that you're going to work your way to heaven, but it's saying that the things that we do and maintain in good works, in our character, in our, in our lifestyle. These are the things that are witnesses of Christ to other people. Even at work. Even on the traffic, back up on 64. Somebody's watching. You know you are. You're looking over there to see what's going on next to you. And they see your rage. even at the grocery store, even in your home. So the question comes to us, does life inside the church look any different than life outside the church? Do Christians', Christians lives look any different than those who do not hold to the saving face of Jesus Christ? Do our lives look any different? Do we adhere to what the world says is right? Do, do we follow the teachings of Christ completely or, or do we sort of sway and give in and... and Negotiate with God. God's word is true. God's word is faithful. And what he says is truth. So I guess the question that comes to my mind is, are you becoming more and more like Jesus? Or are you becoming stagnant in your relationship? Are you becoming more like his presence filled with him? Or are you becoming more like the world and transitioning into the things that you sort of ride the fence on? Not willing to address or confront. Or is my relationship with the Lord dependent on what someone else will do? Is my relationship dependent on whether pastor does what I like or not? You see, it's a personal relationship. You may not like what I do. Maybe I'm wrong. But I'm the one who has to answer for that. Maybe I've made a wrong choice and you say, well, I could have seen that coming. I'm the one who has to answer for that. God has a plan for you. And God is a sovereign God. And God is so sovereign that even if the things of life and the things of this world try to distract us, that his will will be accomplished, probably not in my timing. Probably not even in my way because I become selfish. I make the plan for God and look for a stamp of approval. That's why we must be different than the world. Have you really given him your heart? Have you given him everything, every breath that you take is a reflective of who he is? I believe the Lord wants to do something in our church. I believe the Lord wants to do something in each life. But we have to be a willing vessel. We have to be an open vessel that says, Lord, come correct me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, take this. Lord, I want more of you. 
and raise our hands in surrender to who he is. Would you bow your heads? You see, our tendency is to hear the truth. And then we get busy grabbing grabbing the candy wrappers from this pew. And then we get busy doing things and, and thinking about where I'm going to lunch. And before the Holy Spirit can even begin to work in us, we've already closed our minds. I'm challenging you today to open your heart, your mind to the Lord and ask him to examine you today, now. Do I need to apply these faithful sayings of understanding, of understanding that he came to save the lost? That he's placed a call on my life to be the very best that I can be for him. That it takes work in growing and maturing in the Lord, that it takes understanding the power that we have available to us. We're going to close in a moment. Kelly's going to sing. I invite you to examine your heart, examine your mind. I pray that distractions would be dismissed from this place that you could sense and you could know and you can feel the presence of the Lord and that you will be obedient to his speaking and invite you to come find a place of prayer Worshiping him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind is your desire to follow him above everything else. Have you lifted your heart and your hands to the Lord in just praise for who he is? Will you give him your heart? breath you take. Father, I pray right now I believe there are some who are battling within their spirit the battle of surrender. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to them. Thank you, Lord, for those who came to pray. Hear the cry of their heart. Know their heart's desire. We want to give you our hearts. We desire to give you all that we are and to walk in your ways. Be men and women of integrity and character and the likeness of Jesus as we go through this life. Thank you, Father, for who you are. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your writings through Paul to these two young pastors. Thank you, Lord, that they didn't give up. 
thank you, Lord, they didn't walk away from that which they were called and serving. Thank you that we have the word of God to lead us, guide us, and direct us. And we pray these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? May the truth that Christ Jesus came to save sinners fill your hearts with love and grace. And may you never neglect your calling to show Jesus to a dying world. Go now in peace, knowing his salvation is for you and for all who believe. And live and behave accordingly.